Hello. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry I'm late. Are we all here? Jazz hands if you can hear me. Oh, do you know what? I'm the worst, aren't I, in real life? Like if any of you are late, I give you a really hard time because I think it's really important to be punctual. And here I am, late for the first time in my life for a meeting in my own house. So, anyway, I won't waste any more of your time. Today we're going to be talking about The Scream. Um, painted in 1893 by an artist named Edvard Munch. And it's one of the most reproduced images of modern times, you know, which is quite surprising, really, because it ain't that pretty. I'm pretending it's here. Can you see the screen here, by the way? Jazz hands if you can see the screen. Brilliant. I've succeeded at something. But if I put my hand here, it disappears. Right. OK, I will try and stand on this side of the screen. Now, so, it's a pop icon staple, isn't it? Like, everybody has used it, from the Home Alone movie poster to the Simpsons. And it's an emoji, of course. And, you know, we most of us use it every single day when we're tweeting about Trump or Boris or Brexit or basically anything that's happened in the world in the last five years. It's become really entrenched in modern culture. So let's go back and find out a bit about it. So it was first painted in 1893. There's actually five versions of it. So let's start at the beginning. So this is a pastel um, from 1893 and it was probably the initial sketch for the one painted in the same year which is the most famous version which is the one we're all familiar with. We see it everywhere. And then um, in later years, we got another pastel, which we're going to come back to this one because this is actually um, has some writing attached to it, which is very important um, for us to know while we're looking at the screen. And then in 1910, there was another painting, which this is 17 years after he created what is considered to be the definitive version. So why would Monk paint another version of the screen um, so long after he painted the original. Well, Monk was a hoarder and he, when he died in 1944, he bequeathed his art collection, which was in his house to the city of Oslo. Now that consisted of 40,000 um, items. There was about a thousand paintings, but 10,000 drawings and graphic arts. And there were an equal number of letters you know he was quite possessive over his work and he begrudgingly sold it and I kind of was thinking that because the scream is such an emotionally driven work that he probably considered it part of him and after he sold it you know I think he probably regretted that a bit I sold a painting a couple of years ago which I loved and the second it sold I instantly regretted it and I kind of I don't know, it's weird I, I miss it now I wished I had it. I wished I never sold it it was like putting my children up for adoption I shouldn't say that really it's not a fair thing to say because I don't miss my children at all but I can just imagine that Monk especially if the painting really started getting a lot of attention afterwards that he wanted it back and so I think that his version that he painted so long after in 1910 was because he missed it and wanted to reclaim it for himself. So that's two pastels, two paintings but he also created a lithograph stone and um, made many prints of it as well. Actually I saw that at the British museum when they had their um did any of you go to that by the way yeah it's great wasn't it pick this up in the gift shop so that's the um what am i saying a copy of the print that um came off the stone some um, got a lot of movement in there but it's very clear i like it a lot but that exhibition at the british museum it was ace i mean you kind of go to these exhibitions because you know the screen but you come away feeling like you knew him it, it, it was a really brilliantly narrated exhibition and i actually think it would be hard to find 
another artist who's so famous for one painting who has such a vast body of work that most people don't know too much about and actually I'm not even going to talk about any of that today because we're talking about the screen haven't got time to get into all the rest but um we will talk about him another time now let me tell you about his history very quickly and figure out how this man came to paint the screen at the age of 30 so he's Norwegian um has a relatively large family, three sisters, one brother, mum and dad. But sadly, mum dies of tuberculosis because there's a pandemic, of course, because nothing ever really changes in this world. It just goes around, comes around. So sadly, she died of tuberculosis when Edvard was five. He actually painted this picture. It's called The Dead Mother. And even though this was painted after the scream... It does echo the figurative depiction of the central figure in the scream. So is this a way of Monk telling us later that his inspiration, the motivation behind the painting of the scream actually started at the time of his mother's untimely demise when Monk was five? After his mum passed, um, he developed a strong emotional connection to his older sister. And sadly, she died also of tuberculosis when she was 15. In this painting, the sick child, we can see his aunt totally distraught at the side of his dying sister. And, you know, Monk also suffered himself. He had tuberculosis when he was a young child. Um, he survived, obviously, but also in his family, there were varying strands of mental illness, which saw another of his sisters incarcerated in an asylum for most of her adult life with schizophrenia. Now, if all of that wasn't hard enough to deal with, his dad, who was a doctor, but was also a religious fanatic with a odd predilection for the afterlife. Which is weird for a doctor, right? You could just imagine, can't you, going to see him and you say, what's wrong with me? And he's like, well, you have tuberculosis. And you go, OK, what are my options? Well, I hear the afterlife is very good this time of year. I mean, all of this, <laughs> when you put all of this together, there's a quote, actually, that I'm going to read. This was in um, Monk, Monk Kept a Journal. And this, this is a, uh, something he wrote in it. I inherited two of mankind's most frightful enemies, the heritage of consumption, that's tuberculosis, and insanity. Illness and madness and death were the black angels that stood at my cradle. Oh my God, that's so sad. I mean, it just makes you wonder how it took him as long as 30 to come up with this painting. No, this he painted this in primary school knowing his history you would totally believe that would be something he came up with as a child devastating right so that kind of gives us an idea of the road that we're on and how we end up um painting this type of picture right so the title of this painting is the scream but like starry night that's actually a popularized title and it was not the title which the artist gave the painting now, when Munch painted this in 1893, um, he gave it a German title, which was, <laughs> I need to check the notes, um, which was Der Skrei de Nature. That is not a German accent before I get any more comments. Um, the, the, Der Skrei de Nature, which literally means the scream of nature. He also gave it a Norwegian title, which is Skrik. That was a Norwegian accent, <laughs> Skrik, which translates as shriek. Now, if we go back to the second pastel version that I showed you, underneath this, there is an inscription. And um, this is what the inscription says. I was walking along the road with two friends. The sun was setting, the sky turned blood red. And I felt a wave of sadness. I paused, tired to death, 
above the blue black fjord in city blood and flaming tongues hovered my friends walked on i stayed behind quaking with angst i felt the great scream in nature so felt is the operative word here he said that he felt a scream he didn't hear a scream and the other people in the painting don't appear to be hearing a scream either he he felt it now other art historians have tried to simplify the narrative and they've been to the location we know where it is it's in oslo and they've noted that a slaughterhouse was nearby and they assume that monk must have heard the cries of animals being sent to slaughter somebody else noted that the asylum in which his sister was situated was also nearby so they assumed that he could hear the anguished cries of lunatics being restrained but you know i think that's tr too straightforward and monk was not a straightforward person we know that now also he's an expressionist so he's not actually being literal when he lays stuff down onto the canvas so we shouldn't try and dismantle it technically i mean to try and decipher it would be doing it a disservice it's expressionism it's born of emotion so we should respond to it emotionally we could certainly base it on what we know about him his whole unsettled childhood the unresolved grief the domineering dad his own ill health i mean this is this isn't when we look at this painting he isn't just hearing something so this is a culmination of things this isn't a painting of somebody reacting to a specific thing which is happening at a specific time it's so much more than that we know from the inscription right that if somebody out for a walk with two of their friends and suddenly the sun is setting and the sky has gone red and it's triggered him it sent him into a, a spiral of anguish isn't this interesting actually last week's um lesson about starry night what did we conclude that vincent had been influenced by nature and by the sky that is precisely what has happened with the scream how interesting so nature it's called a scream through nature you know this isn't rocket science <laughs> all the information is there should we choose to look for it but it sent him into this downward spiral of angst and despair now here's an interesting thing a year before he painted the scream monk painted a picture called despair now would you like to see it does it look familiar <laughs> interesting huh now also the inscription that i read out earlier uh, that were along with the screen about going for a walk um he also wrote that at the same time as painting despair a year earlier than the screen it was slightly different actually and he talks about leaning against the fence and stuff which he's doing in this painting he doesn't do that in the scream and he does end it i stood there my friends walked on i stood there quaking with angst and i felt as though a vast endless scream passed through nature now this is a more introspective composition isn't it the figure is turned away he seems perhaps pensive and reflective we don't necessarily get that he's quaking with angst so perhaps monk didn't feel he expressed himself successfully here and he worked with the idea again and then less than a year later came this and we immediately undeniably see somebody quaking with angst and this is someone engaging with us the viewer rather than turning away this person wants to be seen wants to connect wants to communicate with us also what's interesting is the devolution of the central figure in despair let me show you this is a sketch that came before the painting of despair interesting isn't it that he's still got in the blood red sky um, obviously had such a profound effect on him but here and from the writing that came at the same time as this sketch we know that this is monk in this picture but as the painting evolved and turned into the screen and now that the painting is more direct the figure has become sexless and ageless 
And maybe this has contributed to the popularity of the painting as the central figure has no discernible sex or age so we can more readily project our own feelings onto it. But this ambiguity can also open this painting up to other interpretations. Now I know some people view this painting as horrific, as scary, and it's understandable, it is dark, it's gloomy, it's unsettling. And I think this became exacerbated in the 1990s. There was a very popular series of films called Scream. Now these were slasher flicks, they were horror movies. And there was this aggressive antagonist who wore a mask based on the Scream painting. So there's a whole generation of people who grew up probably watching the films before they'd even seen the painting. So that stands to reason, really, that somebody would view the central figure as a monster and be scared of it, rather than realising this is somebody who just needs a hug. And in the age of hashtag be kind, we need to start viewing this painting with a renewed compassion and a new sympathy. So if you know anybody who is scared of the screen, you know, we need to start telling them this is somebody in a... In a in, who, who needs other people this is somebody remember despair the earlier painting he was looking away from the camera the camera the viewpoint um the scream is looking out they're directly connecting with us they want us to see them something's just actually occurred to me i'm talking about the scream films like you all know what i'm talking about do you do you know jazz hands if you know the scream films okay I just realised that they've come out in the mid 90s, probably about 1996. I'm going to hate myself for asking this, but jazz hands if you were born after 1996. Yeah, I'm so old. I saw Scream at the cinema. I went with your granddad when we were teenagers. <laughs> um, sorry, I was late. I'm going to go. I'm going to start the next. Um, to immediately after this but I'm going to stop this one because I just realised I haven't put my jacket on and um, I want to look smart because I, I keep these so um, right if you, if you want to go go but I'm, I'm back five minutes